Attention, all troops. He's alive. Alive. Welcome to the Reptilist. When I was a kid, it was always a very special treat when my grandmother would come to visit us. This was not an infrequent thing. She only lived two towns over, and she would come to stay with us all the time. But I always appreciated it, for many reasons. First of all, if you got up early enough, there would be breakfast in the morning before school, and I'm not just talking a bowl of cereal, or even just toast. I'm talking bacon and eggs if you wanted it, French toast. It was awesome. Needless to say, I got up every morning very early whenever she was over. Another thing was, because she was the oldest, there was this rule in the house that the eldest person who wants to watch a television show got the TV in the living room, the big one. This was great because I liked a lot of the same shows she would watch because she enjoyed mystery shows. Magnum P.I., Scarecrow and Mrs. King, you name it. Now, I'm not sure why I sort of fell in love with those shows. Probably because I enjoyed my time with her and also, secondly, because they were on later and when she was there, I got to watch them with her with nobody saying anything about you staying up late. I would just sit in the living room watching her and nobody said anything, so it was great. When the TV Guide came in 1984, and they were talking about a new show coming on called Murder, She Wrote, it would star Angela Lansbury, who I was familiar with from her work in Bedknobs and Broomsticks, which is sort of like a hybrid Disney animated live-action film, sort of in the same vein as Mary Poppins, although not as popular. Well, I thought this was going to be another show that my grandmother and I would watch. And when she came over the next time, she was sitting in the morning having her cigarette, drinking her coffee, and asking me what I would want for breakfast. And I said, I'll just have cereal, but I have some really good news. There's a new show going to premiere this fall with Angela Lansbury in it. I expected her to be very excited. I guess in my head I thought that she, being an older lady, would want to watch a detective show about an older lady. When I watched the detective shows with her, I often pictured myself as those detectives, and when they were closer to me, male, younger maybe. I'm, there were no children solving cases in any of these shows. But when they were, I would try to associate with them. But she did not seem impressed at all. And that was a real head scratcher. And when Murder, She Wrote premiered, she didn't watch it. We continued to watch all the other shows, the ones starring men, but never Murder, She Wrote, which I would watch myself and was a big fan of, but I could never get her to watch it. One day I was explaining the plot of some episode during the first season, and I said to her, why don't you want to watch this show? It's really good. And she said to me, why would I want to watch an old woman solve crimes? And I thought, well, because it's a good show. She goes, I'd rather watch the guys. That sat in my head the rest of the day. I went to school, sitting there thinking, and then it occurred to me. My grandmother really enjoyed the shows where the guys were even younger solving cases. My grandmother liked eye candy. She maybe liked the detective shows because of the plot and stuff, but she had a appreciation for the men who she was watching at. And as I realized this, it became very apparent in all the things she watched that she turned to gravitate toward the shows with the handsomer looking men, and she had a type. It had never occurred to me that my grandmother would find men attractive, I guess. And I guess it was a bit of a revelation at the time. And as I grow older, I think about it a lot when I watch these shows because the more I got to know my grandmother, the more interesting she became. And I guess the more human and the more relatable she was. Well, I'm not sure if you have your grandmother in your life still. If you do, you're very lucky. I suggest while you can, take the opportunity to sit down with them, learn stuff about them. I think the little things you know about them, these little interesting things, will make you appreciate them more now, and the memories you have of them will be so much stronger later. On today's show, we're going to talk about the show that my grandmother refused to watch, Defying Demographics. We're going to talk about Murder, She Wrote. We're going to talk about the plot, its casting, the production of the show, the talented people behind it. We'll talk about some of the changes over the seasons, the guest stars, crossovers, spinoffs, the awards it won, Murder, She Wrote off the television set, and of course, where you can get Murder, She Wrote today. Metagirl is joining us for a new top five list. We have a lot of information to get to, so without further ado, let's start the show.
Murder, she wrote. It's an American television mystery series, starred Angela Lansbury as novelist and amateur detective Jessica Fletcher. It would run for 12 seasons from September 30th, 1984 to May 19th, 1996, for a total of 264 episodes. It wouldn't stop there. It would go on to also be turned into TV movies, and there would be four of those. The show was about the life of a retired English teacher who was widowed and would go on to become a successful mystery writer. Now, she doesn't let any of that go to her head. Instead, she stays in her comfortable life, at least in the first few seasons, in Cabot Cove, Maine. That allows her to be more grounded and makes the character more interesting, although she does travel around based on the duties of being a novelist often or because of family and will solve mysteries in those places, which is good because the Cabot Cove murder rate is way off the chart already. Jessica has a good eye for detail and is well steeped in the art of murder, so she's often able to spot things where even professionals might miss it, which makes her a valuable asset to those who realize she has those skills and to those who are jealous of those skills. They'll often dismiss her as intrusive or as a busybody. As she does travel from place to place, she is often tangling with law enforcement in wherever she lands. And as I said, each one of them treats her differently. But over time, she'll actually develop relationships and there'll be recurring characters based on those law enforcement characters come up from time to time, which makes the Murder, She Wrote universe a bit richer. Today's show is brought to you by your local portrait studio. Want to preserve a memory? Take a portrait. What a wonderful gift to give. What memories will be on display with a photographic portrait. The past is as near as today. those portraits. The producers of Murder, she wrote, Richard Levinson and William Link, had a TV series called Ellery Queen. The show did not do well and folded after a single season, but Link and Levinson liked the idea and they thought that the concept of a murder mystery novelist solving crimes would work on TV. They just needed to find the right way to sell it. So they sat down with writer-producer Peter Fisher, who had worked on Columbo, and tried to come up with something new. They changed the gender of the lead role from male to female. And instead of a younger actor, they decided to go with a middle-aged widow. Now, despite rumors, Murder, She Wrote was never supposed to be an American version of the Agatha Christie character, Miss Marple. There are some similarities in that it's an older woman solving crimes. And, of course, over the course of all the seasons of the show, you'll see a lot more things that line up. But that's just because of the volume of stories. You're bound to have some sort of crossover. And hence, people will easily throw that out there and say, Oh, Murder, She Wrote, Miss Marple. Another association people have with the Miss Marple character is that the title of Murder, She Wrote comes from the film adaptation of Agatha Christie's Miss Marple novel 450 from Paddington, and that was titled Murder, She Said. Despite the fact that Angela Lansbury is perfect for the role of Jessica Fletcher, she was not the first person offered the role. It actually was offered to multiple people before her. It was offered to actress Jean Stapleton, who had been playing Edith Bunker on On the Family for years, and then on Archie Bunker's Place. Stapleton had just been on TV for a long time and wanted to take a little time off, so she passed on the role. The role was also offered to Doris Day, and Doris Day turned it down. The producers thought that Angela Lansbury would actually be perfect for the part, but she was a big-time actress, and they thought, there's no way that she's going to come and do television. But they thought, well, let's give it a shot and see if she's available. Agents talked. Lansbury let it be known that she would be interested in doing a show if it was the right project. 
When she got a copy of the script, she thought, yes, I could do something with this character. As soon as Lansbury agreed to do it, they immediately started casting and got the show rolling. Angela Lansbury played Jessica Fletcher. Fletcher is a retired teacher, crime novelist, eventually would become a teacher again. Angela Lansbury also played her lookalike cousin Emma, who was a performer in London. William Wyndham played Dr. Seth Hazlitt, who was the doc of Cabot Cove and one of Jessica's good friends. He would be on the show from 85 to 96. Before he would get that role, William Wyndham would actually be on the show as a killer. I guess he did so well, and they liked him so much that they decided to bring him back as a regular cast member. But it is unnerving if you've watched the show and then go back to watch one and you see this character that you're very familiar with playing a different one. Which is a problem I have when I watch a lot of old TV shows where they decided to pull someone out of the show and reuse them again and again. That happened a lot on Dragnet. Tom Bosley played Sheriff Amos Tupper. He would last until the 88 season, and then his character would retire. Ron Masek would replace him as Sheriff Mort Metzger. Metzger's a former NYPD officer who takes Tupper's place. He's sort of like Chief Brody in Jaws. He thinks Cabot Cove is going to be this really calm place. Little does he know that it is the murder capital of the world. Michael Horton played Grady Fletcher in a recurring role. Jessica's nephew who always seems to be in trouble with the law, which allows for some great plot lines. Jerry Orbach would play Harry McGraw. Orbach's probably best known for his work on Law and Order, but before that, on Murder, She Wrote, and on the one successful spinoff that went to production from Murder, She Wrote. And we'll talk a little bit about the law and Harry McGraw a little bit later. Len Carew would play Michael Haggerty, who was a British MI6 agent. Richard Paul played Sam Booth who was the mayor of Cabot Cove from the 86 to 91 season. Julie Adams played Eve Simpson, Cabot Cove real estate agent, town gossip, and good friend of Jessica. Keith Mitchell played Dennis Stanton, a former jewel thief and now insurance claims investigator. Now, they might not tell you this, but most insurance claims investigators are former jewel thieves, so they have really interesting stories if you can get them to stop talking about annuities. Dennis is one of those characters that, like Harry McGraw, seemed like he was going to get his own show because they would have these shows about him, and Jessica would never even appear in them. Instead, you would hear her in voiceover. The tone of the show for the first half dozen seasons was about the same. Then, in 1991, new producers were brought in, namely David Mosinger and J. Michael Straczynski. Straczynski's name sounds familiar. It is because he is a prolific writer, producer, worked on some great shows from my childhood. He-Man, The Real Ghostbusters, Captain Power. I also mentioned him in the Twilight Zone 1985 episode that I did. Modern fans probably know him as the executive producer of Babylon 5. Very talented guy. And he and Mosinger brought a new, fresh perspective to the show in an attempt to shore up the ratings. First, they moved Jessica to New York and decided to have her become an instructor in writing and criminology so that we knew more about her profession as opposed to just her wandering around solving crimes. We actually got to see more of the day-to-day life of a working writer. And with those changes, the show's success continued. Sunday. When a college cult becomes a class in killing, will Jessica be a victim of higher learning? By trickery and deceit. An old new murder she wrote. Sadly, nothing good lasts forever, and as the show entered its 11th season, Lansbury started thinking that maybe it was time to end the show. She just turned 70 and wasn't sure if she wanted to keep up this daunting schedule. 
she did not really get to make that decision because CBS decided to move Murder, She Wrote from its comfortable Sunday night time slot, where it had been for 11 years, and moved it to Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Now, as I mentioned, it was on CBS, and if you watched TV in the 90s, you would probably know that there was a show called Friends, which was the 8 o'clock show before Seinfeld came on at 9 o'clock. And that time slot was very difficult to take on, and the ratings plummeted in that season. Even though the ratings weren't great, it had a strong hold of its demographic, which was a bit older, despite fans writing letters and protesting CBS would not move the show. That year, Friends would finish off ninth in the Nielsen ratings, and Murder, She Wrote, which had been in eighth place in the ratings the year before, dropped to 65th in the yearly ratings. That means it lost nearly 6 million viewers. CBS took this as a great opportunity to end Murder, She Wrote. And after 12 seasons, in August of 1996, Murder, She Wrote ended. They did agree to do some Murder, She Wrote movies, and the first one would be broadcast in 1997, followed by one in 2000, 2001, and 2003. We have not seen one since 2003, although Angela Lansbury has said that she would be willing to do more Jessica Fletcher if approached to do so. I say, get that budget going, CBS. We need some mystery movies going. There was a lot of great episodes of Murder, She Wrote, and here's Metagirl with the top five. Five, four, three, two, one. Greetings, retro fans. This is Metagirl bringing you the top five episodes of the television series Murder, She Wrote. At number five is season three, episode eight, Magnum on Ice. Jessica offers to help my hero, Thomas Magnum, who has been accused of killing a hitman. Number four is Season 2, Episode 4, School for Scandal. When Jessica is offered an honorary degree from Crenshaw University, she has no idea she's about to become embroiled in a murder. Number three is Season 4, Episode 20, Showdown in Saskatchewan. Jessica gets involved when her niece becomes smitten with a rodeo rider and refuses to believe he could have committed murder. At number two is Season 7, Episode 14, Who Killed J.B. Fletcher? A fan posing as Jessica is arrested and later murdered. Will Jessica figure out who done it? And the number one episode of Murder, She Wrote is... Season 7, Episode 7, The Return of Preston Giles. Out on parole, Jessica's former publisher tries to woo her back into the fold. And there you have it, the Retroist's top five episodes of the television series Murder, She Wrote. Until next time, List fans, this has been Metagirl. Thanks, Metagirl. When you have a long-running show with a respected actress, you get a lot of great guest stars lining up. And Murder, She Wrote had a high number of Academy Award-winning actors like Ernest Borgnine, James Coburn, and Martin Landau, as well as other big names like Milton Berle, John Astin, Robert Culp, Jane Greer, Buddy Hackett, Florence Henderson, Dorothy L'Amour, Virginia Mayo, Roddy McDowell, you name it. This show had a tremendous amount of talent on it, and not just old talent. You had young actors, some who had just established their names, others who were still coming up in the world. You had, of course, George Clooney, Andy Garcia, Joaquin Phoenix, Courtney Cox, Neil Patrick Harris, Megan Mullally, Cynthia Nixon, and Billy Zane. An interesting little fact, a lot of the cast of M.A.S.H. made an appearance on Murder, She Wrote. Only three of the regular cast members of M.A.S.H. did not appear on Murder, She Wrote. And the three who didn't make an appearance were Alan Alda, Gary Berghoff, and McLean Stevenson. I wonder if that was chance or if they realized at some point, hey, we'd cast a lot of the people of M.A.S.H. on the show. we got to finish this off. And then they just never got around to those three. Someone who else who was on Murder, She Wrote was Tom Selleck and John Hillerman because there was a crossover episode of Magnum P.I. and Murder, She Wrote, and each one appeared on the other show. The episode that Tom Selleck and John Hillerman appear in as Magnum and Higgins is... The episode called Magnum on Ice. Great episode. 
Murder, She Wrote was a ratings juggernaut, and until its last season, always finishing in the top 13. In season one, it was number eight in the annual ratings for the year. In season two, it was number three. In season three, it was number four. Season four, number nine. Then in season five, it jumped back to number eight. Season six, number 13. Season seven, number 12. Season eight, number eight. Season nine, number five. This was 92, and the show is now doing better than it did its first season. Season 10, number 11. Season 11, number 8. And then when they moved it up against the new show Friends, it plummeted to 65, which I mentioned before. It makes me wonder, if they had kept it on Sunday, how long could they have kept this show going? And those are really decent numbers for a Sunday. I don't know what they were thinking. The show was very well received and would get many award nominations and would actually win some awards for people. Unfortunately, Angela Lansbury, who was nominated for an Emmy Award for every season that Murder, She Wrote was on, never won. But it did win for Outstanding Music Composition for a Series for John Addison in 1985. It won for Outstanding Costume Design for a Series for Alfred E. Lehman in 1986. It won a Golden Globe Award for Best TV Drama in 85 and 86. And it won an Edgar Award for Best Episode of a TV Series for Deadly Lady. So John Addison won an award for the Murder, She Wrote theme song. Let's give it a listen. Addison is best known for his film scores, and he won an Academy Award and Grammy Award for Best Original Score for his work on the 1963 film Tom Jones. When you have a show that runs this long, often what you'll see is attempts at what are called backdoor pilots, where they would have an episode of the show that was about a completely different character, maybe one you'd never met before, and the story revolved completely around them. And this is sort of an attempt by the network to see if audiences are interested in this character and maybe seeing if they could spin it off to another series. And there would be many of them on Murder, She Wrote. Oddly enough, the only one that made it to series was based on a character who appears in the first season of Murder, She Wrote. And that was Jerry Orbach playing Harry McGraw. And the law on Harry McGraw ran from September 27, 1987 to February 10, 1988, and starred Orbach kind of as a rude private detective who finds himself solving mysteries on behalf of attorney Ellie McGinnis, played by Barbara Babcock. I guess the show was going to be sort of a moonlighting, will-they-won't-they they thing, but it never lasted. Only half a season, and Orbach would go back to reprising his role as Harry McGraw on Murder, She Wrote, and then later would become very well known as Lenny Briscoe on Law & Order. So if you have watched every episode of Murder, She Wrote, you might also be interested in the novels based on the series, and there are 38 of them in total, written by Donald Bain and published by the New American Library. And they have pretty good titles, Martinis and Mayhem, Gin and Daggers, 
the main mutiny, and they're almost as creative as the Jessica Fletcher novel's names in the series, ones that were never published, but Jessica supposedly wrote. My favorite titled book of Jessica's is the very first one, The Corpse Danced at Midnight. What's not to love about that? If you were lucky enough to visit Universal Studios Florida in 1990 through 1996, there was a Murder, She Wrote theater interactive show. In it, the guests were selected to executive produce a new episode of Murder, She Wrote, and the show focused on the production of effects, makeup, sound, all that great stuff. Sadly, although logically, after Murder, She Wrote was canceled, the attraction was closed and replaced by Hercules and Xena, Wizards of the Screen. In December of 2009, Legacy Interactive licensed the Murder, She Wrote franchise and released a game based on the television series. In it, you help Jessica Fletcher solve five murders. A sequel has been announced, so there will be more Murder, She Wrote computer magic. We'll return after these messages. stimulation they need. We offer Pepsi Free, made with absolutely no caffeine. The only stimulating thing about it is that exhilarating Pepsi taste. Caffeine Free, Pepsi Free, because life is stimulating enough. Available in regular and diet. They're really quick in Frisco and Philadelphia, PA. Quaker Chewy Granola is a snack for today. Quaker goodness and great taste have made Quaker Chewy Granola Bars America's favorite. Come on, get Quaker. And now, back to our show. If you're a big fan, you probably know that Murder, She Wrote is still running on some TV stations, both local and things like TV Land. All 12 seasons of the DVD have been released. Recently, there was a big price drop on them, and the release of the four TV movies as a package is going to happen this year. Although it was supposed to happen last year, and it was pushed back, it now definitely seems like it's definitely happening this year, probably within the next month. So 2012 is the year for Murder, She Wrote movies on DVD. If you do not have a television signal, and a lot of people have cut that cord, Murder, She Wrote is currently streaming on Netflix, so... No excuse not to watch this great show. Murder, She Wrote was one of the last great detective series before it was replaced, I think, almost completely with the sort of procedural, grittier dramas that have become a staple on television. The show did not need to rely on the process of solving a crime. Instead, it relied on good writing and a talented cast that week after week delivered a very watchable product. It is a great show to watch with the entire family, unless, of course, certain members of your family would prefer to watch younger, shirtless men running along the beach instead. Uh, I'm not naming any names, I'm just saying. Some family members liked that sort of thing. Thanks for listening to the show. For more retro fun, drop by the website at www.retroist.com. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook. I'm at twitter.com slash retroist and facebook.com slash retroist.com. Thanks to Peachy for the music you hear during the show. If you'd like to get in touch with Peachy, you can email him at peachy at retroist.com. The version of the Murder, She Wrote theme that you're hearing now is by Nick Everett. You can find more of Nick Everett's work on his SoundCloud page at soundcloud.com slash Nigidovich, which is N-I-G-I-D-I-V-I-T-C-H. You can find this particular song on his YouTube channel, and that is at youtube.com slash user slash N-I-G-I-D-I-V-I-T-C-H. Nigidovich. You'll also find those songs linked from the post about this particular episode. Thanks to Metagirl for the great top five list. If you'd like to get in touch with Metagirl, you can email her at metagirl at retroist.com. 
Thanks for listening to the show, and I hope you have a great weekend.
Retroist Podcast, episode 101, Murder, She Wrote. Take 16. This has been a Retroist production. Goodbye.